taking refuge in generating bodhicitta. Sangye cho dangso ki cho nam la, jagtu badu dagni kyap su chi, dagi cho nyen gi pe so nam gi, drola penchir sangye dru pa shog. I go for refuge to some enlightened to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create the listening to the Dhamma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create the listening to the Dhamma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. All right. Okay, we're just continuing with the second installment of this mind training um, examination. So mind training or lojong in Tibetan, uh, in a sense, is the core practice. Everything is subsumed or included within mind training. In fact, the the whole of the teachings of the Buddha, in a sense, are just different elements of mind training. Uh, and the term in Tibetan, lo jong, jong there can mean training, it can also mean purification. Uh, lo means awareness or the mind. Uh, lo rikpa shepa, there's three that are synonyms in Tibetan, lo rikpa and shepa. Uh, and they all mean all consciousness together, minds and mental factors. So in a sense, it's like the universal training of the mind, both the mind itself and its accompanying mental factors. So if we extend that out, it's we have six main minds and 51 mental factors so in a sense, we're training in all of those. So mind training is just that. Taking into account our current state of mind and purifying it, identifying what uh, is problematic and training ourselves to gradually uh, weaken it and eventually stop it from manifesting and then beyond that eventually to eliminate it at a seed level so because the mind is so extensive and deep this process takes a long time so to purify the mind takes in the perfection vehicle three countless eons so it's we need patience in the practice and one lifetime um is not enough to really train the mind and in fact in the texts on logic such as the pramana vartika of dhammakirti in the second chapter there one of the proofs for rebirth is that uh, you can't generate um, great compassion and bodhicitta in one in one short lifetime. Profound, it's so profound a practice, so extensive, and requires so much effort and so forth that um, more than one lifetime is required. And because people have generated great compassion, that itself is the proof that we had a previous life, or that person has a had a previous life, and we do as well. So mind training uh, takes up many forms. And in fact, the entire teachings of the Buddha are summarized in the 84,000 instructions. Uh, one way of you know, looking at this, the issue of the teachings of the Buddha. So therefore the 84,000 are 21,000 teachings directed towards overcoming attachment, 21,000 directed towards overcoming anger and 21,000 directed to overcoming ignorance. 
and a further 21,000 to overcoming all three together. Uh, we may think, well, why are 21,000 teachings necessary to overcome? Um, anger, for instance, uh, really the 21,000 are needed because Anger, is, the habit of anger is so pervasive, so deep. And anger is expressed in so many different forms, on a manifest level, on a manifest level. On a manifest level, it can um, be uh, acted on mentally, verbally, or physically in so many different ways. Uh, we have so many black karmic seeds generated by anger to overcome. We need this broad... Uh, extensive presentation to help us see the faults of anger. So to attachment, so to ignorance. And even when they come together, because ignorance supports attachment and anger or hatred, uh, then there can be two roots that support our negative actions of anger. That is ignorance plus anger itself. And so all of these teachings of the Buddha are directed towards understanding the function of the mind itself and what is problematic and what's not problematic. What's not problematic are the 11 virtuous mental factors. Uh, even though we might have, we might grasp a true existence, even so, the action of love based on uh, the assumption that a self exists is still virtuous, it's still beneficial. So that's not something we need uh, to eliminate, at least in the short term. Gradually we have to overcome ignorance that supports love and so forth until we achieve the practice of pure love, which is uncontaminated love and so forth. But we're certainly not there yet. So we've been dealing with the Atisha's teaching, who introduced the teachings of Lord Zhong to Tibet. And he had three main students, uh, and that was uh, um, there was a teach there was <clears throat> excuse me, John Temper was the main one, but he also had Kutern and also another uh, who was, uh, I'm just getting some name here. Mok, Mok like the Shadow. So these three teachers were instrumental in absorbing the mind training teachings from Atisha and disseminating. The main disseminator of the teachings of Atisha was John Temper. And John Tumba himself is regarded as an incarnation uh, of the Dalai Lama, or we're putting it around the other way, John Tumba later became the Dalai Lama. So we can see from this the core influence of Atisha and John Tumba on the later Geluk school of Tibetan Buddhism. And that these core elements of uh, the Kardampa school, which Atisha established, are uh, also manifesting later in the Giluk school, such as uh, Lam Rim. Lam Rim is really based on the teaching of Bodhipata Pradipa, or the Lamp of the Path, that was composed by Atisha. And the other element there is the, the mind training teachings, which are really teaching uh, exchanging self for others and uh, teachings on emptiness as well. So compassion and emptiness coming from uh, the school of the Kadamba. Now this was also expanded by later students also, the, initially the teachings on mind training were kept very secret, uh, but then probably from the time of 
Potawa and Langritampa and Kamalungpa, these teachings became more open and were taught publicly. But initially they were very private and only passed on to students who had um, achieved a sufficient maturity in their practice such that they would be able to practice these teachings. And one of the first texts is the text that we're dealing with that teaches publicly the mind training system, and that is by Geshe uh, Langri Tampa and his eight verses on mind training. So we're dealing with Geshe Chekawa's commentary on Langri Tampa's uh, eight verses of mind training. So, so far we've just done a bit of introductory um, examination of the eight verses and uh, some of the background information about the eight verses in the last session. So this session we're going to go into the commentary by Geshe uh, Chekawa. Now, Geshe Chekawa was uh, a generation after Geshe Langri Tampa. Geshe Chekawa was really a student of Geshe Sharawa. So these are practitioners at the very early period of the mind training uh, system. And they were extraordinary practitioners. They really um, took to heart the teachings that were given, given them and they practiced very strongly, very um, uh, with great dedication. So their example is important for us. Their comments are important for us. Their experience um, is important for us as a, like a guidepost to how, how we should uh, strive to practice. Uh, because the opportunity to practice doesn't always exist for us. And if we can generate uh, the enthusiasm to practice in this life, it will have profound positive uh, influence on our later lives. So the more we're able to achieve in this life, uh, the more our later lives are going to benefit. So we, this whole project that we have of attaining enlightenment is the most difficult thing that we can you know, aspire to achieve. It's almost inconceivable for us to get a picture of what enlightenment is uh, because we're so um, used to, habituated to unenlightened states that even though we understand the, the term enlightenment and we understand the definitions of the term, what the actual state is, we still have really not much of an idea. And other than that it's completely different than our current state, how we exist in the present. So in a sense, one can see the challenge. You know, how do I completely get beyond everything that I know uh, and actually start walking on the path to enlightenment and actually getting to the point of, for instance, the path of seeing, because the path of seeing is the first moment of transcendence that we will experience. And transcendence, they're meaning the transcendence of samsara or the afflictions, uh, a state of complete purity, where the mind is completely transcendent and uncontaminated. So that remains a goal that we have. And we need to reflect on the path of seeing as much as we can, because that is really the perfection of wisdom, the beginning of the perfection of wisdom, actual perfection of wisdom. Right, so we'll just start on the first page of Geshe Chekawa's uh, commentary, the commentary on the eight verses of mind training. So I hope everyone's got the text there. 
So first it says, herein is contained the eight verses on mind training, together with the story of its origin. I pay homage to the sublime teachers. So it's good for us to uh, pay homage to sublime teachers. So really the sublime teachers are those that have attained the transcendent path. They are really sublime. They have really transcended the mundane, ordinary state of being such as ourselves. So in order to generate the merit to attain that state, we need to pay homage to those that have attained it. Again, it's a little bit like taking refuge. One takes refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. One takes refuge in the Sangha as those who have attained the path of seeing and above. So why is one paying homage? Why is one taking refuge in those? Because one is seeking to attain the transcendent state so that what is the transcendent state? The transcendent state from among the four truths, the four noble truths, is the truth of cessation and the truth of path. So they represent the, the core refuge. The, uh, they are the <clears throat> jewel of dharma. The jewel of dharma is just the truth of cessation and truth of path. And the jewel of Buddha is the one that has realized directly uh, the transcendent states of the truth of path and the truth of cessation. So for us, they sound like dry and rather academic ideas. And that's fine. That's okay at this point. But the more we bring them to mind with a mind of faith, uh, then gradually the, the closer we potentially move uh, to these states. As it said in Tibetan, gomna lilarlar drogeres, which means basically everything becomes easier through familiarity. So if we bring to mind the three refuges and the core refuge there being the, the jewel of Dharma or the jewel of Buddha, actually in the Gyu Lama, in the Uttara Tantra, Maitreya says the core refuge is the Buddha himself, the Buddha who manifests uh, the jewel of Dharma, who is the jewel of Sangha, is the core refuge. It doesn't really matter how we see this. So when we say, I pay homage to the sublime teachers, we're really taking into mind the refuge and what qualifies uh, something as being our refuge, something that we can rely on, something that we can um, seek that is of authentic value and transcends the ordinary state of our existence, which is pretty hard to, for us to bear, pretty hard for any being on the planet to bear. And again, that in Maitreya's Uttara Tantra, as he points out there, that we feel um, disappointment with samsara uh, all the time. It never really fulfills our hopes and aims and aspirations. There's always an element of disappointment. Uh, and the fact of being disappointed is a sign that we have Buddha nature. That internally we have Buddha nature that seeks to attain full manifestation of itself, of our Buddha potential, so that we become an Arya being, we become a noble being, a, uh, an uncontaminated being. And by doing that, we fulfill our potential. So our general disappointment with existence is the sign that we have potential, this unlimited potential. So that also is a wonderful thing. So we're paying homage to the sublime teachers here, you know, really to awaken our potential. Because the more we focus on the sublime, uh, the more the seeds of Dharma that we have within our mind stream 
are awakened. So continuing with the text, now Geshe Chekawa once remarked, my admiration for the Kadampas first arose when I heard the eight verses from Chak Shingwa. And Chak Shingwa, I'll just check the note here, 414. Uh, Chak Shingwa as a disciple of Gya Chakriwa, who was in turn an important student of Langri Tampa. So these are mm, these monks, these practitioners are you know swapping experiences and you know picking up hints and so forth from each other. And this is one thing that he heard that really stuck in mind. Oh, he, there are eight verses that were taught by Langri Tamba. So therefore, thereafter, because of that, he was inspired. I studied the verses and meticulously memorized the words, repeating them until I arrived at Lungshu Gegong. Now, I'm not sure where Lungshu Gegong is. So the one thing that we can take note of there is that when we pick up a practice that inspires us, uh, then certainly we can um, we need to address it. We need to memorize it. We need to, um, you know, uh, accommodate it. We need to assimilate it by memorizing it or by keeping it in mind as much as we can. So anyway, he memorized the words and repeated them until he arrived at Lungsha Gigon, yet he failed, as he says, I failed to realize their meaning in my heart. So we've heard these eight verses of mind training many, probably different times, but still we haven't taken them into our heart. This is, uh, you know, our common, uh, a common, uh, what, common thing amongst us as practitioners. So he's admitting that. So we can see initially he's quite honest about this, but he wants to relate this to us. For if these verses had ended my heart, things would have been quite different by then. And the same for us, because, uh, you know, this first verse or the eight verses have not really been taken to heart. It hasn't changed us much at all. We still tend to be quite the same as before. Nonetheless, whenever the fear of being attacked by bandits and such appeared in my mind during my journey, I reflected upon these verses and this helped. So his core advice at this stage is, well, memorize them or tattoo them on your arm or, or you know, have a little card that you can show yourself. Uh, and whenever you feel a little bit despondent, through fear of bandits. Now in Tibet, this is a thousand years ago in Tibet, uh, bandits were a problem once you got out of the main towns and people would be in fear, any traveler would be in fear of what might happen on the road. Uh, it's a little bit the same for us, but we're often in a, in a less fearsome situation, but still. Uh, he says that he benefit, benefited when he reflected on these verses. Also, I was often in situations where I had to seek shelter with strangers when my mind turned wild and untamed. So this is helpful for us because our mind is often wild and untamed. And uh, so we should, if possible, Recite these verses when our mind is in that sort of a state. See if it works for us as well. During times when I was confronted with seemingly unbearable situations, such as failing to secure a suitable shelter, or when I became a target of others' disparagement, these verses helped me. So here's three instances there where they helped, but he hadn't, they hadn't changed his inner mind at that point. So what are these verses? They are the following eight verses. So he first gives the first verse. With the wish to achieve the highest aim, 
which surpasses even a wish-fulfilling gem, I shall train myself to, at all times, cherish sentient beings as supreme. So just in terms of um, the words, they're easy to understand. Uh, but the point is, how are we really you know, doing in terms of uh, assimilating these words, practicing them? Uh, <clears throat> and for instance, when he talks initially there about the mind turned wild and untamed, these verses help when he recited them. But what does he mean by the wild and untamed? So I was thinking to just uh, look at a passage from Abhidharma on this issue. And this passage from Abhidharma is, uh, reflects on the nine states of the tormented mind. Now, the nine states of the tormented mind is taught extensively in both in Abhidharma and in Perfection of Wisdom. And they we are often um, enslaved by these minds. They control us. They bring a lot of unhappiness and to us. So I'll list what these nine... Uh, I'll read a little bit, actually, of this uh, commentary where they're embedded. From among those most negative tendencies explained by the desire on just these four afflictions occur. These four afflictions occur. Anger occurs in our desire on uh, because it is not moistened by calm abiding or shamatha. It's not affected by that. So what are these nine states of the tormented mind? What are they? So they are exemplified by the statements, I was harmed, thinking I was harmed. I am being harmed. I will be harmed. So there's first three. And the second three, my friends were harmed. My friends are being harmed. My friends will be harmed. And the three exemplified by the statement, my enemies were benefited. My enemies are being benefited, and my enemies will be benefited. So these nine thoughts are called the nine states of the tormented mind. And we are affected by them on a daily basis. You know, just the thought, I was harmed by such and such. It's a type of thought that comes to mind, and then... Because when it comes, when it arises, we don't challenge it. Uh, then what is called mm, inappropriate attention allows that mind to grow. And we start to look at it more carefully and then give reasons for why it's true. And then we start thinking, what, what should I do to respond to that harm that's been done to me? And we come up with, you know, a dozen different uh, possibilities. And so we may think that, that line of thinking may occupy us for an entire day. We pick it up and put it down, pick it up, put it down. So I was harmed is the first of the, of the nine states of the tormented mind. The first tormented mind, in other words, I was harmed. I am being harmed. And then we, we can also then easily bring that mind into the present. I'm being harmed by that person that harmed me yesterday as well. And I will be harmed tomorrow by that person or that situation and so on. Just thinking that is a tormented mind. It is heavy, uncomfortable, um, based on ignorance. So it's a sort of a darkish type of thought. Uh, and it doesn't bring any happiness, any relief. So this is, uh, I think here, when he speaks about when my mind turned wild and untamed. So this is the one of the types of wild and untamed thoughts, the nine 
tormented minds, for instance, that can arise. So in that regard also, I was uh, <coughs> anyway, uh, there's another quote that I'm just going to bring up, but I can't find it. I'll find it later. So we must be aware, if possible, of these minds, because when they arise, if they arise in a state where we have, uh, we're lacking uh, like discernment, we're lacking wisdom, we can easily allow those minds to continue. If we have inappropriate attention, Sushin Mimpa Yilachepa in Tibetan, meaning that if a negative thought arises, but instead of being like on our guard, we have a, a state of mind that is just sort of a little bit uh, slack, loose, uh, and is it willing to accommodate a negative thought, in other words, then that negative thought can grow within us, within our mind stream and become stronger. And at the same time, laying down black karmic seeds imprints within our mind stream that will also have an effect later. So it's very important for us, if possible, to, again, be aware moment by moment, you know, of this, the functioning of the mind. This is real mind training. Mind training is a moment by moment examination of the mind in the present moment. And when we see any of the nine states of the tormented mind arising, we stop. We don't allow them to uh, generate or increase or grow in strength. We have to be able to stop them if we, if we can. Just being aware of them. Sometimes, I mean, for instance, in the the Bodhisattva deeds of Shanti Rakshit, uh, of um, <laughs> in the Bodhisattva deeds, it said that when the mind comes like that, when it's unworkable, and say, for instance, a tormented mind has arisen, then we should treat the mind as like a block of wood. Just we can't do anything with it, but just don't, don't. Uh, allow it to expand in a negative sense, but we should practice mindfulness and introspection and guard the mind from doing anything. Uh, and we should, by that method, uh, train the mind. Right, so then underneath the root text there, and the final verse of the root text is, cherish sentient beings as supreme. Okay, then the verse, the commentary under that. In general, in order to train yourself to view each sentient being as a wish fulfilling gem, you should recall two important points of similarity shared by sentient beings and the precious gem. First, if you submerge the wish fulfilling gem in a muddy mire, the gem cannot cleanse itself of the mud. However, if you wish it, if you wash it with scented water on a full moon day, adorn the tip of a victory banner with it and make offerings to it, the gem can then become a source of all earthly wishes. So true, if we have a, a gem that is really, you know, genuinely valuable, a valuable gem, then we keep it clean and we display it properly so that the value of it may be appreciated. In the same way, sentient beings afflicted with the various defects of cyclic existence cannot free themselves from the mire of this unenlightened state, nor can they wash away their sufferings and the origins of these sufferings. However, with your help, with our help, all the benefits, both immediate and ultimate, can issue from them. Without sentient beings, how would you obtain even the 
immediate benefits. These would cease immediately. Even ultimate happiness arises in relation to sentient beings. On the basis of sentient beings, on that basis that we attain the unexcelled state of Buddhahood. So the verse itself is cherishing sentient beings as supreme. The wish to achieve highest enlightenment, which surpasses even a wish fulfilling gem, I shall train myself at all times, cherish sentient beings as supreme. Two at all times, cherish sentient beings as supreme. So uh, sentient beings as like a wish fulfilling gem, sentient beings as like a gemstone. Uh, now this training is extremely difficult because we're habituated to seeing other people as something, you know, a mixed group of beings. Some are friendly to us, some are not. And uh, even the ones that are friendly, we don't think of them as gems or wishful feeling gems. Um, we're quite uh, cautious about how we deal with others. So this type of instruction goes against our normal uh, way of dealing with others. Now, in order to begin to appreciate this first verse, then we really have to start to investigate what the gem is, what a gem is, and how sentient beings are likened. How are they gems? In what way are they gems? So I thought to have a little bit of a look at uh, sublime continuum, because in sublime continuum, uh, then in that text, we see that sentient beings are really treated like, like a gemstone. So I have a passage that I just wanted to read out. So um, what it says in verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 15 is, they see reality, here talking about Buddhas, they see reality because reincarnating beings are comprehended in essence as suchness pacified, because the mind in essence is thoroughly pure, and because affliction is exhausted from the beginning. So in fact, Buddhas see sentient beings as like... Um, you know, actually thoroughly pure, as suchness or emptiness pacified, as thoroughly pure, in essence, thoroughly pure. And beings for whom actually the afflictions are pacified from the beginning. Pacified from the beginning because they don't truly exist at any point. Sentient beings, therefore, have the have Buddha nature, which is the potential to attain the state of complete enlightenment, they are like jewels. But not only that, in their own right, they are like jewels. For us, they're like a wish-fulfilling jewel because all of our happiness depends on them, whether it's temporary happiness or ultimate happiness. Without sentient beings in the present, of course, as Kishichekawa mentions, we can't even get ordinary happiness. We rely on others. We rely on our mother and our father. We rely for our very birth and for the, having the body that we possess. We relied on our parents. We rely on our mother to look after us, to care for us, to teach us, to um, instill upon us some sort of ethical appreciation and so forth. So that all of our happiness is either coming from mm, the just the inter ordinary interaction we have with other beings, or it's coming in an ultimate sense because we realize that all these beings are from the beginningless beginning actually 
with Buddha nature that is absolutely pure. And in dependence on that, our happiness also manifests. So if we care for those that have Buddha potential, then we can gradually awaken our own Buddha potential. So we need to reflect on these types of teaching uh, regularly with many examples because we don't know in a sense by which, which piece of information, which piece of advice that we receive from others is going to be that which leads us to into the actual practice. Just as uh, Gishi Chekawa mentions at the beginning of this, beginning here that uh, he first memorized the, these words when he, when he heard them from a fellow student and something captured his mind, captured his imagination, and he decided, yes, I, that I must train in. I, there's something of value there. I don't, I don't see it yet, but I'll memorize them. And he memorized it, but still he wasn't able to uh, bring it to a deep level within him, the practice. So we, we are similar to that because we get lots of advice, we get lots of teachings, but not everyone has, makes a, an impression upon us. Those teachings that we get that do make an impression, that we puzzle about, they are really valuable. Uh, and so here for Chekawa, we should uh, keep in mind his journey and use it as a template, I think, for our own journey. That if it's these verses that speak to us or others, others of mind training and other texts, then we can persevere in the practice of those, um, you know, as a core teaching for us personally, something that we need uh, to manifest, to manifest internally, to bring to life inside of us. For instance, I have this uh, in another tradition, in the Chan tradition, there was a practitioner called Zhu Feng, uh, who at one stage said the following words, human life so fleeting is but a brief instant how can you dwell for long in this evanescent world? No use bringing up others' faults again and again. One's own mistakes must be cleared away continually. So that's another type of um, training advice. It's a type of main mind training uh, advice. No use bringing up others' faults again and again. One's own mistakes must be cleared away continually. So this is really uh, also speaking to this point about seeing other beings as like a wish fulfilling gem. They're not at fault. We can't think about their faults again and again and again, which we do. Um, we should take these beings as they actually are. They have Buddha nature. They have uh, Buddha potential. So they have what's called in Tibetan Ranjineric or natural Buddha potential, which is um, the emptiness of the ordinary stained mind of a being. That is Buddha potential. The evolving Buddha potential is just the stained mind itself, the ordinary stained mind, stained with the afflictions, hatred, anger, ignorance, and so on. The emptiness of that is also the Buddha nature, Buddha potential, uh, because those stains that exist in the mind can be removed. Uh, gaining faith in that is extremely important because we have the problem. The problem that confronts us is that we make the same mistakes again and again and again. 
And the issue is, why don't we change? When I accept the teachings, I accept that, uh, yes, I have Buddha nature, others have Buddha nature. I tend to just see their faults more than having that good quality. Why? Why is that the case? Uh, we need to really, you know, spend time examining the mind, our own mind, and see how it functions. Just as Geshe Chekhova had done. And when we're inspired by a particular teaching, say, for instance, these eight verses, then we should look at them very carefully, go through them word by word, memorize them if possible. Or memorize the verses that really speak to us. Uh, and then see if we can practice it, you know, like, you know, for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And just if, if we can't, then we come back, to, we stop and we go back to the beginning and restart the practice again. Okay, let me examine my mind. And we have to judge to see whether what is virtuous and non-virtuous within our own minds, moment to moment. If we have single-pointed concentration, if we have shamatha, if we have shine or karma biting, it's much easier. Because we're often distracted, it's hard for us to keep track of uh, what, what's happening within the mind itself. However, these teachings such as all beings have are like a wish-fulfilling gem. They actually are. Um, however, we have doubts about this. And we, and, you know, like um, we tend to think, well, probably most people do, but there are some that probably don't. And we could list, you know, a couple that we have strong grudges for. But we still know that, okay, I can, I'll get beyond that at some point. But really, we notice that our training is not sufficiently strong in the present because we get distracted easily. And having distraction is a sign of not having any of the nine stages of calm abiding, of mental placement, for instance, which generate um calm abiding or perhaps we have one first stage or the second stage and so on but we still uh, are quickly what overcome by distraction there are six types of distraction in fact our normal activity is that you know we have good intentions we think about the dharma a little bit but then we're distracted and an hour later we think oh i should practice a little bit and then we get distracted and so our normal activity is, is like this. So we need a lot of patience with ourselves. And we also need effort. For instance, when attaining single-pointed concentration, uh, effort is required right from the very beginning. And if we see the, the tanka on the nine stages of mental placement, we see that the you know the ordained being is first heading down the road on the, to attain the first level of mental placement with a lasso in his left hand and a, a, a spike in his right. And the lasso in his left hand is mindfulness and the spike in his right is uh, introspection. And he's chasing a black elephant, which is his mind. And the black elephant is being led along by a black monkey who is distraction. So we have mindfulness and introspection that we are going to seek to like to lasso the elephant of the mind and then direct the mind with the, the hook of um, introspection. But then as beside that, in the tanka, there is a fire and the fire represents the effort required. So it's a big fire. So initially we have a huge amount of effort to put into this practice to attain single-pointed concentration. We need, you know, like 
again and again and again, we have to gather our strength and put energy into lassoing the mind and taming it with the hook. Why do we do this? Because the distracted mind is not very effective in terms of Dharma practice. And reflection on our death is a good motivation to gather our strength in the, you know, in the present today and tomorrow and so forth, in the very present. This has been the way that practitioners in the past have addressed these issues, and it is exactly the same for us today. So, okay, now I was going to actually um, also just talk a little bit about um, another thing that comes up there is the Buddha nature. Um, that sentient beings are like a precious gem. The precious gem, like nature, is the fact uh, that we rely on them to attain enlightenment, uh, but also that they have this gem-like quality of Buddha nature in their mind streams. But that gem-like quality is obscured by the afflictions, just as it is for us. Our Buddha nature, our Buddha potential is obscured by the afflictions that manifest. So if we can think on this, this helps us to see our gem-like Buddha nature, the possibility of that Buddha nature within, and also within other beings. So I thought to just read a little more of the uh, Uttara Tantra. So this is verse 102 on the first chapter. Just as when a human who possesses the stainless divine eye sees the Tathagata, a Buddha statue ablaze with a thousand signs, resides deep within a discolored lotus, they remove it from the lotus's petal covering. So too when the Buddha eye sees the suchness of beings exists in those abiding even in a Vichy hell, Lords of compassion who abide in the final limit without this obscuration, meaning in state of enlightenment, liberate sentient beings from obscuration. And again, it goes on to say, just as when those possessing the divine eyes see a Buddha statue enclosed deep within a repulsive or a rotting lotus, which is like our state, they cut the petals to release it release that statue. So when a Buddhist sees that the heart of a complete Buddha obscured within the stained covering of attachment, aversion, and ignorance exists in all reincarnating beings, the compassionate sage annihilates that obscuration. So this is the first of nine examples that are given in, a, um, in this particular text by Maitreya Uttara Tantra. So for us, our Buddha nature is like a Buddha statue that's obscured within a decaying lotus. So the decaying lotus is the three poisons, the poison of ignorance, attachment, and anger. So we fail to see it because it is so thoroughly covered. Uh, and we don't see it in others because also their Buddha nature is thoroughly obscured by the three poisons. But Buddhas see it because they have the divine, they are, they have the eye of enlightenment. And seeing it, they try, they, they put forward any and every method possible to get beings to awaken to the fact of their Buddha nature. And this Buddha nature is like a gem. And within us, it is like a gem that we need to awaken how we awaken it is here given as seeing the gem-like quality of Buddha nature within the mind streams of all other beings. So therefore we have that first verse. With the wish to achieve the highest aim, which surpasses even a wish-fulfilling gem, I will train myself to, at all times 
to cherish sentient beings as supreme. So if we understand the Buddha nature, then it's possible that we can um, begin to appreciate the fact that they are not our enemies. They are not, they are not objects that generate the tormented mind for us, for instance. They are much more important than that. They are, they are just like us. Uh, and of course, the, all of mind training is based on equanimity. So seeing the equality of self and others uh, is of foundational importance. We can't, until we see ourselves and others as being the same, uh, then really mind training has no foundation. So this first verse does require um, a considerable amount of contemplation in order to bring us to the point where we see them as a wish, other beings as a wish fulfilling gem. Right now, again on page 278, we'll move into the second verse. So here, Langri Tampa says, whenever I interact with others, I will view myself as inferior to all, and I will train myself to hold others superior from the depths of my heart. So again, we hear this, these verses. We've read them many times. Uh, but the need for us is that we have to read them many, many, many times more uh, so that we break down our habits our negative habits. And so here Geshe Chekhova then gives the explanation. As stated here, wherever we are and whomever we interact with, we should view, train to view ourselves in all possible ways as lower and to respect others from the depths of our heart. So others encompasses those who are higher than us, such as our spiritual teachers, those who are equal to us, such as our fellow monks or fellow friends and so forth, and those who are inferior to us, such as beggars. So here, he's really just giving the social, um, socio-economic definition of higher, lower, and equal. So that's how we would refer to others you know, from a social point of view, but actually all these other beings are equal to us. Whoever we look at, we regard as equal. In all respects refers to our family lineage, mental capacity and similar factors. Actually, in all respects, I can't see. It doesn't occur in the verse, so it must be part of the uh, commentary. Um, I, here I'm viewing all of these as superior to me. I'm seeing myself as inferior. In all respects, seeing us, oneself as inferior refers to our family lineage, mental capacity, and similar factors. We should reflect upon our own shortcomings in relation to these factors and avoid becoming proud. Uh, so this also comes up in the nine types of pride or the seven types of pride. This thing that we have with uh, judging others and myself being at the same level of someone else or a little bit better than someone else or a little bit in inferior to someone else, but these types of judgment really rest on uh, grasping at a self. And they are um, just superimposed, uh, what, thoughts, superimposed on the situation of our ordinary life. 
that really don't have much uh, much benefit. Well, they're not that accurate. They're not really true. So we should not divide other beings up into higher, lower, and equal. In fact, this whole process just is like a, you know, a breeding ground of the affliction. So as soon as we think we're a little bit higher than someone else, pride is generated. Pride is one of the six root afflictions. It's a distortion. You see, we should see ourselves as inferior. So this is something that also we have have a need to, you know, investigate at great length, because day by day we're confronted with this. Uh, you know, we have this idea of who's better, who's worse, who's equal, uh, who do I need to um, ignore, who do I need to pay attention to. Uh, you know, the financial status of others, the intellectual status, their knowledge status, their family status, uh, and so on. My status within the family. All of these issues again and again and again come up. And they cause a lot of heartache, a lot of friction, a lot of uh, searching of our own mind as to, you know, why does this all create such turmoil for me? And so on. And not only does it cause turmoil for myself, it causes turmoil for others, others in our family, our friends, in the wider world, and so on. We are really victims of this mental process of organizing things into um, organizing others as either higher, equal, or lower, and as friend, enemy, and stranger, and so on. So here, Langley Tamper is suggesting, whenever I interact with others, I should view myself as inferior to everyone. So that makes it simple. I just, I'm the lowest of all. Now we have issues with that because uh, really this is not the way of society around us. If it was, it'd be great. If everyone just saw themselves as the least of all, as the lowest of all or inferior to all, we'd get on very well with everyone. But of course, we are in a, a dog eat dog um, type uh, social environments where we have to struggle to survive and to exist and even to flourish. And ethics is often not highly valued in our social interaction by many. There are Hopefully, you know, a core group that are absolutely committed to ethical practice. Uh, they are important. They are the ones that will preserve society. But here, this goes beyond just a normal ethical evaluation of those around us. It's taking that to the level of a mind training practice that now with all these beings we interact with, that we have very complex arrays of assessments of them and us and our uh, and the current state of play of whether they're higher, we are higher, or so forth, or just what we are them something, they are something. There's all of these issues that play out, and we're you know we're all aware of them. But here, the advice from uh, Geshe Lami Tamba is see myself as lowest of all. See myself as inferior to all, and I will train myself to hold others superior from the depths of my heart. So this is a genuine, you know, like ultimate statement of how I will regard others. I will always regard them as superior from the depths of my heart, genuinely. Uh, now, often when it comes to this verse, it's said that, well, we don't have to show it, though. We don't have to go walk around, you know, and um, prostrate to everyone in the street and so forth, or, you know, like bend over in homage to everyone as we're walking along. In fact, we can act just normally. It's just that internally, 
the way we initially react and then subsequently re react to everyone is taking into account this attitude that I'm taking myself as inferior to that person and all others as superior without it necessarily having to show because actually um, we need to function in society as well at work and all other places and we need you know to uh, probably assert authority with our children with friends with work colleagues it's not saying that it's saying that just in in the depths of our heart where we don't have to say anything to anyone, it's before anything else happens, I'm regarding myself as inferior and them as superior in order to undo this habitual pride, arrogance, overestimation of my own worth in relation to others, because we all have equal worth in Buddha nature. But in order to counter this habitual tendency, I'll see myself as lowest of all. So it's a, it's a very skillful, technical attitude or a, um, practice that is going to um, smooth things out a little bit for us. But we don't have to tell anyone that that's what I'm doing. If we did, I'd say half the people would think we're stupid, an idiot, fool, being taken advantage of by others. That's not the issue at all here. The issue is really awakening our own Buddha nature. And to awaken it, we really have to uh, follow these types of instruction. This is very common um, to all of mind training. Hold others superior from the depths of my heart. Now, again, we probably because we have so many doubts about this type of practice, the doubts are the strongest element at present. And we, you know, those doubts are strong and in our face. And, uh, and we wonder whether we could actually successfully practice this in, a, you know, a normal in, environment. But of course it can be done, of course it's done. It's done by people everywhere. Some people naturally practice this type of practice due to their ethics in past lives. But if, uh, as Atisha, I think, said, that if we want to attain enlightenment, this one needs to practice uh, Tonglen. One needs to see oneself as the least of all. And it's often said the Buddhists see themselves in that way. They, they see themselves as the slaves of everyone just making themselves available to obnoxious beings such as ourselves, for instance, uh, allowing them to, you know, to be with us so that they, they can teach us. But, you know, our, strong, our negative habits are really quite strong and not very pleasant, not very attractive. So this is the way... Because one's seeking to do this at the very depths of one's heart, where the imprints and the karmic seeds reside, for instance, the only way the transformation can really take place is practicing at the deepest level. So there, to hold one other superior uh, from the depths of one's heart. So we should try to overcome becoming proud. So I'm down about seven lines. We should reflect upon our own shortcomings in relation to these factors and avoid becoming proud. So this tendency of us to see ourselves as superior um, is really a, a reason because we don't reflect on our own faults. And we, it's hard for other people to correct us. And so we need to overcome this internally and, and begin to understand our shortcomings and faults and overcome our pride, start to lessen our pride. So then he goes on to say, thinking all belong to the lowly class 
of butchers, we generate pride on the basis of our physical existence. So one example here is we may think, oh, you know, the local butcher, you know, is a has an inferior uh, calling or occupation, and we may then just treat them a little bit differently because uh, of their occupation. Uh, and then he goes on to say, say, with skin the color of rusted gold, we are not even worthy of a sentient being's gaze. So I think what he means by that is we look down on others such as butchers and various other people with uh, occupations that are not highly regarded. But in fact, we might have a darkish color skin. And by having that, that's often regarded as being a sign of lower class or caste, for instance, in India and elsewhere. And uh, so therefore, we ourselves may not be, you know, like looked upon as being, you know, a, a, of a superior type being, you know, with light colored skin and so forth. So in other words, we have to keep in mind all the faults that we possess in order to um, <clears throat> stop ourselves from generating pride. In fact, we're so accustomed to pride that it's almost impossible to go out and without looking down on certain people, looking down on everyone, hating everyone. Um, for one reason or another, perhaps we don't like them because we think they're not practicing any sort of ethical practice or they're not engaged in mind training or something. So we look down on everyone that we see. And of course, this is the very opposite of the practice. Hmm. So then moving on from that here in the last paragraph on page 278, with respect to our cognitive capacities, we, if we feel proud despite our commonplace lack of distinction, reflect, I am ignorant of every one of the five fields of knowledge. Even in those fields where I have listened with care and attention, I fail to discern when I miss certain words in their explanation and their explanations. And so there, again, with pride, when pride arises, we should think that there's so much that I don't understand. Here, the example given is, I'm, every, I'm ignorant of every one of the five fields of knowledge. So these are the classic five fields of knowledge in the East, they come from the Sanskrit tradition, you know, so the core five and out of five. So the core five could be, you know, like religious topics, logic and so on. Um, and then the out of five could be, you know, like poetics and grammar and mathematics and so on and so forth. So when we reflect, we have to think to ourselves when such a mind of pride arises that I don't know very much. Even the topics that I've studied, all of them as well, I don't know everything and I still make mistakes. I still haven't understood many of the core elements of these topics that I've trained in for many years. So again, it's it's almost as if we're blind to our faults here, blind to the pride and all the myriad ways that it manifests within us. <coughs> but the need is in in training here in the first verse and the second verse. The need is uh, that we start to become aware of this pride, and when we notice it, to to act to um, counter it. But we first have to notice it. Otherwise, it becomes a bit like the wallpaper. It's just there all the time. And we think that it's an inextricable part of our existence, our existence that is really not very comfortable. Not, it has little contentment, little happiness. Because of that pride, because of the mm, arrogance, because of the jealousy, and the anger and all of the others. 
they create this impossible situation for us. So here, Gishi Chekawar is saying, be careful of pride. And when it comes, just think of all the things we don't know. And then four lines, five lines from the bottom. In my behavior too, though I am known to be a monk, there are hardly any negative deeds I have not committed. So on an ethical basis, he's talking about himself as a monk, but you know, for lay people, we should reflect on all the faults that we committed that go against the vows that we've taken. So for instance, about bodhisattva vows, tantric vows, have five lay vows, uh, and so on, then we have to recall all of all the errors that we've committed in terms of actions of body, speech, and mind. And that, you know, we can't see ourselves as being better than others because we have vows. Like we're not even sure if we still have vows because we've broken so many of them. And we can't, honestly, you know, like quickly say, you know, what do I still, what are the vows that I've kept purely within a, my mind stream? Like the Bodhisattva vows. Uh, and again, this is due to distraction and due to not studying them enough, so forth. So that we need no pride, to generate no pride in that and look down on others in that area. But we can't look down on, on others in, in any area whatsoever. Even in this very moment, my thoughts embody the three poisons and my actions of body, speech, and mind remain mostly impure, mostly negative, black. So even in the current moment, when I would try to uh, <clears throat> say, well, um, you know, I have some ethical, ethical uh, behavior, still there's no unethical mental factor that I'm not generating. What is it that I have stopped generating? I'm still generating ignorance. I'm still generating anger in all its forms. I'm still generating attachment in all its forms. The three root poisons, I'm still generating. Why should I look down on other people as if I am ethically superior? Therefore, as he says in the second last line, in the future, it will be difficult to attain birth in the higher realms, let alone liberation. So on that basis, what basis do I have for even a human rebirth? If most of my mind is taken up with the three poisons, do I get a higher rebirth, such as a human rebirth or a divine rebirth? Um, is it possible? What if I look inside, where is the cause for that future human rebirth? You know, where's the guarantee? What do I have in writing? What, what do I have there that would support my claim or aspiration to a human rebirth or even liberation? What is the path to liberation that I've already created in my mind stream that will lead me directly to liberation? Where is the pathway that will lead me to a future human rebirth? And so on. So he's uh, advising us uh, to be, you know, realistic. Let's stop looking down on others through pride, thinking that I'm ethical, when in fact I'm an embodiment of an unethical being. Just by the performance of my mind, you know, up to this present moment. So then on the next page, Shanti Deva's Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life states, by this type of behavior, even the human form will not be obtained. If I fail to achieve human existence, there is only evil and no virtues. So Shanti Deva is warning us if my behavior is like this, if I look inside and I can't really find the basis for attaining a human rebirth in terms of white action, uh, then an, even a human form will not be obtained. So if that happens, 
If I get reborn in hell, for instance, what then? If I fail to achieve a human existence, there is only evil. There is only this prospect of suffering uh, in some level of hell. Or as a hungry ghost, or as an animal. For instance, so what are the virtues that I have within my mind stream that makes me superior to others around me when I walk around and see all these other people? I don't know. They may be more virtuous than me. All of them. Right. So we just read a little bit more. In the commentary then, in this manner we should contemplate all our shortcomings and reflect, nothing falls beneath me but this river. So we contemplate our shortcomings and realize that our shortcomings are on the large end of the scale. Nothing is beneath me other than a river. In other words, all, I'm the lowest being here. But this is not just some sort of affectation, not some sort of, oh, well, yeah, I, I'm acting out a spiritual path here, so I need to say this. In, here it's talking about the reality of our situation. And we have to be realistic. We have to be honest with ourselves about where we actually are in our practice. There's nothing worse than to think, oh, yes, I've had this initiation, that initiation, and I've been practicing for 20 years or 30 years, and yeah, you know, I'll get a good rebirth and so on. We don't know. When we look at our mind to try and find the basis for a future human rebirth even, we just don't know. So therefore, Geshe Chekhova says, diminish our conceit and learn to respect others. So we have no choice. The reality is, again, what we should be thinking is, how do the Buddhists see this situation? I mean, the Buddhists see us and our situation, and they see how we interact with others with pride and arrogance. They must be shaking their heads and thinking, oh, that, that poor misguided soul who thinks they're a practitioner and go around as if they're, you know, they've understood Buddha Dharma. But their actions are worse than uh, than the dev the devils themselves, as is mentioned in some texts. So again, all of this is done here. All of these words are given out by Geshe Chekhova and Geshe Lamri Tampa in order to get us to examine where the truth, the fact of where we are, of our mind. Because it's only through training the mind that happiness is possible. And so their advice to us is train your mind. And in order to train them, your mind, here we're advised to have less pride, to st stop generating pride, because we don't possess the qualities we think we possess. In fact, we possess many faults that we haven't even recognized yet. So this uh, then becomes part of the foundation of our future practice. So, okay, we've reached this point. We're on page 279. We might leave it there for today. Um, and, and there's just some time if there's any... Anyone has any comments to make or any issues that have come up with the text so far, anything that I might have said that you may disagree with and so on? We may have a little time now if everyone can turn on their microphones. We could just have a brief discussion. Jay? Okay, so I'm just wondering what the advice is about when I hear about eons and eons in order to do anything, 
I get pretty discouraged, put it mildly. How, <laughs> how, how does one deal with that feeling of like, oh, this is too long, too hard. And I realize it's my own, what can I say, imperfection in terms of my being stuck on a time concept. But, you know, it's kind of a human. <laughs> it is. Yeah. yeah. No, no, Jai, it's, I, I agree. It's daunting. We talk about eons and eons of practice that's required. Uh, and, the, and because this comes up in the six perfections, the perfection of effort. And the perfection of effort is the ability to, you know, remain in the deepest hell for countless eons in order to yep. benefit even one sentient being. Yep. That's the sort of effort that one uh, needs. Um, so it is daunting, but uh, this is something that uh, is written about at great length. This uh, how to deal with, you know, the feelings of um, discouragement, of uh, being inadequate, of you know, disappointment with one's practice, and can I actually, you know, uh, myself into the path, you know, and develop this sort of fortitude and patience and effort to persevere to attain realization. These doubts occur to everyone. So we're all, not alone. And in fact, uh, there are many ways of addressing this, but we do need to probably break it up instead of thinking along in terms of eons, then just, you know, this lifetime is probably big enough for us at present. And if we can make some improvement in this lifetime, then, you know, it, that will help. I think, as it said, you know, a, a supreme, you know, a, a practitioner should face death uh, without any regret. So if we can, a practitioner that actually practices and starts to diminish uh, their negative actions and purify a certain number of negative actions are able to face death without any regret. Uh, practitioners on a higher level that not only purify a lot, but really make some steps along the path, you know, like supreme practitioners, when they face death, it's like an elephant um, tormented by the, the sun, the heat of the sun plunging into a lotus pool. So one's death then becomes like, you know, this uh, pathway to, you know, like happiness. Uh, now at present, it's, it's hard for us. Uh, so we really need to train ourselves to endure, uh, you know, the, just the ordinary state of existence that we have. And it's painful. It's samsara. And to recognize that this samsara experience that we have, we are a samsaric being, and samsara is the mind-body continuum that I possess, that's samsara. Uh, and it's, it's subject to all these causes and conditions that would, you know, create pain and unhappiness for us. It's just part of our current level of existence. We need a, an ocean of patience with this. Uh, but then conviction in the law of cause and effect that practicing virtue is the way forward. That the practice of virtue and practice of ethics is the cause of happiness. And so we just have to, in a sense, tough it out. And also with the mind that everyone else is in the same boat, they're doing it tough. And to have uh, sympathy for all other beings. Think about others. Is it, <clears throat> you know, um, there was a, this uh, saying that comes from a, a Zen story about a monk who was instructing a young child and the child was asking about, you know, how, how one practices, you know, and uh, thinking about it. Uh, others, you know, how you generate compassion. And the monk was saying, well, actually, you can generate compassion for everyone. 
But because everyone is so consumed by themselves, by their own self, they don't have room to think about anyone else. So for them, it's very hard to generate compassion. Really, the mind is, you know, what can I say, limitless. And it can take on, you know, the role of the Bodhisattva. But the role of the Bodhisattva depends on diminishing the thoughts of I. And our fears are really embedded in the thought of I, you know, like self-cherishing self and self-grasping. So those, especially cherishing oneself, self-centeredness, self-importance, these are the great enemy of the great vehicle path. So we have to lessen them. The more we think about others, the happier we become. As it said in the Lama Chirpa, we have to stop thinking about ourselves and just think about others. Thinking about others is the cause of all happiness. Again, Lama Chirpa, the Guru Puja. So that, that, that kind of tees into another question I have, which is similar, which is, um, you know, you talked about, well, we've got to stop negative thoughts and we have to guard the mind. So my thought was, okay, other than just sort of like holding back and suppression, I need a positive activity. And what you're saying, if I understand it correctly, is a positive activity is to focus on that sense of compassion. Is that what we're talking Correct. about? Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Because uh, compassion is one of the 11 virtuous mental factors. Uh, it's the mental factor of uh, nonviolence, which means compassion. So generating that as strongly as one can, yeah. you know, throughout the day, throughout the night, with reasons, you know, as to why one should generate compassion, um, is an excellent practice because to the extent we can generate compassion, to that extent, the mind settles, the mind. So that yeah. means dispelling the thought about I, not thinking about I, Turn that off and just think about others. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But this takes, this is the real mind training. That is the core mind training from this text. Thinking about others. Okay. We should stop there for today. Thank and you. Thanks, everyone. Did you want to do the closing prayers? Uh, do you think we should? We can. Yes. We still have time. It's up to you. Uh, I'm easy, actually. How do you feel? Okay. Well, we can do the um, the uh, the the beginnings of closing prayers. Yep, that sounds fine. Good. Okay. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, mm -hmm. may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living mm -hmm. beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And then we can pray for the long life of uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama all of our teachers and gurus, and for the swift return of Lama Zopa Rinpoche. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.